How nice to be outside and see real people. And for the record, the uh, assembled media is following uh, COVID facial covering uh, protocols to the letter, and it's appreciated. Um, the governor's informed me that for these sessions, when we have some social distancing, it's appropriate for the speaker to take off um, the mask. So I'm going to do that and then slip it right back on. Um, we appreciate very much having Governor Lamont here today and to seeing uh, the assembled media. Um, I know that you have a big, big picture in a great many respects to cover today. Um, the thing that we would express is that we are excited to look forward as part of the reopen Connecticut phase two plan to bring the Connecticut Science Center back online soon. And that is part of a much bigger picture that the governor and his team are leading. So it's my uh, honor now to uh, stand aside and uh, invite Governor Lamont to the podium. And then I'll fill in some blanks about the Connecticut Science Center's particular plans uh, as is appropriate. Governor, thank you. Well, thanks, Matt. And I'm glad to see the Science Center is going to be getting over and open next week. Uh, a lot's getting open next week. Uh, that's uh, going to re represent about 95% uh, of our economy will be open uh, on May 17th. A couple days later for the Science Center, but not, not much. And I love being here at the Science Center, what it represents, an amazing public-private partnership. I'll just give you quickly uh, the numbers. Uh, our infection rate was... Um, you know, lowest we've seen in a long time, down around 2% or less. Uh, that's incredibly important. Hospitalizations are two-thirds below where they were when we opened up on phase one, May 20th. Two-thirds below where they were. So I don't think we opened too early, and I think we've opened cautiously, and I think uh, we've kept things moving in the right direction. And that's why um, May, that's why June 17th will be such an important uh, change for us going forward. Obviously, restaurants, hotels, and the such. I just wanted to reflect for a minute, if I could. It was about 100 days ago, almost 100 days ago, that we got hit by COVID. And uh, now, next week, we're going to be reopening a uh, final piece of our economy up to 95%, like I said. And uh, we've learned a lot. And uh, I just wanted to reflect on that as we think about what could happen in the future, what could happen as a, a second wave, and just more broadly. I mean, one of the first things when I became governor is I saw a state government that didn't always work together. Everybody was talking about silos and every department, every commission doing their own thing. We said, let's get a chief operating officer. Let's make sure these departments can work together, a little like I was used to in the private sector. Well, COVID sure woke us up to that because all of a sudden we were having a unified command meeting virtually every day for 60 days. And we had every commissioner and we had police and we had the not-for-profits and we had the hospitals virtually around the table. And we realized, oh my God, public health has a lot to say to corrections. And everybody wanted to hear from DAS, Department of Administrative Services, because they were tracking the flight from China, bringing the next supply of uh, gowns and masks that were in such a uh, short supply back then. So we learned a lot about how we work together better as a state. I also realized it was a health care crisis, and you need the hospitals at the table. When I talk about a bigger table, it's not just the state government, but it's a broader group than that. And frankly, the state hadn't had a great um, relationship with the hospitals uh, going back some time. Uh, we patched that up. Hospitals were at the table early on, and they worked together as one. It was so important. I mean, when our southern hospitals, southern part of the state, were getting overwhelmed, our hospitals here in Hartford were there to uh, be able to help out, help out with masks, help out with vents, help out with the nurses. And then um, it was southern Connecticut's turn to help out as well. And that's what you realize you could do when that table is bigger and it included the hospitals. Another thing I tried to do when I came on was they said, look, Connecticut's not an island. And we do better when we work uh, with our neighbors. In this case, I was talking about our neighboring states. And when I had that uh, fishing trip with uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, you know, we were talking about what could impact all of our states. Back then, we were thinking about, you know, economic development and transportation. We were also, at that point, thinking about the idea of a cyber attack. And obviously, a cyber attack knows no border. 
Well, we learned pretty quickly that COVID is another attack that knows no border. And we found we were working together very closely, all the regional governors. Uh, what we had to do in terms of um, closing down our schools uh, more or less at the same time, although most of the schools have closed down already. You know, Andrew and I and Charlie Baker and I up in Massachusetts wanted to close down bars and restaurants at the same time. We saw them as places where infection can spread and spread quickly. And we and we did that. And now slowly we are reopening. Obviously, we're reopening a lot faster. They are in New York. They're in a different place in the pandemic. But it's very helpful for us to be speaking with one voice. Uh, as people say, what's next? What's next in the pandemic? What's next in terms of how we secure ourselves? What's next in terms of schools and phased reopening? And uh, the message coming from the White House is not always uh, as clear as day, you might say. And I thought it was really important that we governors were able to speak with one voice as well. Another thing I realized early on was um, hospitals were a big piece of our solution in a health care crisis. We also needed the scientific community. We needed epidemiologists. We needed um, those that specialize in infectious diseases. We had a lot of amazing people in our state government. Uh, I think you've learned that. I, I've certainly been reminded of that. I hope uh, the people of Connecticut, during our briefings on um, most afternoons, you got to see the people in public health and public safety and social services working, you know, seven days a week in many cases, doing everything they can to make sure we kept this uh, pandemic under control. But we don't know everything, and we're much better off when the table is bigger. We have that outside expertise at the table. And that's why we created the reopening committee, the scientific team led by Dr. Ko. We also had a business group, mainly small business, restaurants and retail and hotels. And uh, we really wanted to make sure that it, as we explained what the scientific rationale was for closing things up, also how we could get things open, why we get things open and how we could do it safely. It was really important that the Restaurant Association be there so they were on board, understood what we were trying to do. And also labor was at the table so that employees would feel uh, safe going back to work. I, I love the idea of a bigger table. I said that when I came on board. I was thinking about legislators. I was thinking about state government officials. And I was also thinking about folks not in government. And there, um, you know, we learned a few things. You know, after a while, um, the reopen committee started getting some pushback. You maybe heard it. Um, they said, who are these, um, you know, corporate talking heads? Who are these academic elitists? Who are these people coming in and telling us what to do? Uh, I said, thank you. And I say it again. We need you. And we'll need you next time that things come on. And I hope that relationship is going. I know the hesitancy about um, not having everything decided within here, this uh, Hartford ecosystem. And, uh, but I think we're better when we keep open on this. And we worked hard to keep our legislators briefed. I think uh, Len Fasano and Dr. Coe have a very close relationship as we worked hard with the legislature to make sure they knew what we were doing, why we were trying to do it, and if they had a better idea, where they would take it. Then, you know, just uh, last week, you probably saw that the Connecticut partnership uh, also um, went the other way. You know, again, that was a, a group of outsiders. That was um, a little more complicated because there was private money and public money side by side. I thought it was an amazing template. I thought we could take $100 million of public resources, turn that into $300 million, and use that with not-for-profits and educators, the legislative leaders, all at the table, making sure we could do more for our kids. And I thought this was the important time to do it. Our kids have been out of the classroom for the last three or four months. What we could do with that money to help them get ready for school and make sure school is there ready for them. Anyway, um, we got to think about how we get those folks, you know, involved. Uh, within a week or two of um, us announcing the partnership, somebody went to the floor of the uh, State House of Representatives and said, who are all these... Um, uh, corporate bond guy, uh, board guys dropping dollars on we peasants. And I got to tell you, that was an attitude uh, that um, killed any opportunity for us to do much fundraising. And I got to figure out how we can do better to 
put together a structure that is transparent, that gives you confidence they're acting in the public interest, and we can leverage their amazing resources, their intellectual resources and their financial resources. And I'll just leave you, um, you know, when I took over, I saw, uh, I saw the Port Authority, another, again, another quasi. And Lennon said, hey, watch out for these quasis. They, uh, we need clear rules of the road in terms of reporting and the such, how they do it. And then uh, before that, we had the uh, lottery. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Len and I'm going to ask Joe Arasimowitz, um, a Republican and a Democrat, House and Senate, business and labor, to work with me to see if we can figure out what are the rules of the road where we don't stiff arm people that want to be helpful in any way, but we welcome them to the table in a way that we can um, tap their expertise, tap their incredible sense of citizenship to participate and make a difference, just like um, we used the reopening committee to make an enormous difference here on close to day 100 of the COVID crisis. I think we did a lot better by utilizing the incredible wealth, talent, expertise of the entire state of Connecticut. And I don't want to think that our resources end right here in this city. Uh, that's what I wanted to tell you as we uh, think about June 17th and our next stage going forward. Thanks, everybody. Contact tracing uh, and recent protests. Can you walk us through what the state looks like as far as contact tracing some of those protest groups and what that really looks like? Yeah, the question is, if you can hear with all the traffic, contact tracing, and um, don't, don't these protests, uh, you know, make that a little more complicated? Because you probably were not in contact with uh, four or ten people, but you were in contact maybe with hundreds of people, depending on uh, that. And it's incredibly complicated. And I see that Andrew Cuomo uh, said, uh, look, go get tested. Uh, I see that uh, Dr. Burks said, whatever you do, if you've been to one of these protests, don't go visit your parents or grandparents for a while. Wait and see if uh, there are any symptoms. A time will tell whether this leads to a flare-up or not. It's going to be pretty darn complicated to track and trace each and every one of those possibilities. Did Zano and Arasimowitz agree to do this? You already asked them. And, and what's your agenda? I mean, this... Are you asking them to look back on what happened? Or are you asking them to look forward? No, I want to look forward. I don't spend a lot of time looking back, Paz. Um, uh, I've talked to Len about this quite a bit. I've talked to Joe about it uh, somewhat as well. I said, how do we put together structures that the outside folks know that they can come in and participate in a way? They need to know what are the rules of the road. What you, as we put together these commissions, what are the um, expertises you want at the table, first of all? Is everybody subject to FOIA? Do you read all their emails or not? Do you do it if you're on the board here at the Science Center because they take public money? or do we have different uh, carve-outs? How about financial reporting? Does everybody have to do that? Give us clear rules that I can tell the greater population. We want you, we want you involved. We're a better state for your involvement, and here's how we do it. We have an activity in mind for another public-private partnership that this would clear the road for. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I was just talking uh, the other day with our um, police accountability and the Transparency Board. Again, a wider group of people from outside. Many of them are public officials already, as you know. But I think the table is much more uh, informed if it's more inclusive and you have a wider variety of people there. And I don't want to stiff arm them. I want to welcome them to the table and find a way we can do it that also involves the legislature so we feel confident we're doing it in the interest of the public. Excuse me. Will C is not responsive to the question of, do you have something in mind right now on what you want to do with a public-private partnership in the future? Uh, again, I think if there was another pandemic, I need another reopen committee, and I need scientists who will be at the table to inform me. Right now, maybe there's a little hesitancy given some of the uh, challenges. Uh, I've got um, an economic development team, as you know, and I've got 4CT. These are folks who are volunteering their efforts every day. I want them involved. Um, those are the type of programs I'd like to continue to grow and expand. I want to see other quasis going forward. As you look at what we did on the Port Authority, look what we did as we try and rejuvenate uh, the lottery. I want the best and the brightest knowing they can be on that board, feel confident that they're on that board, and they know what the rules are. What kind of help are you going to need from the legislature? You talked 
earlier about the benefits of working together, regionalization, what you've learned. But there have been casualties. People have lost their lives and businesses have been decimated by this, by being closed. What kind of proposals or work do you want to do with the legislature? What is necessary to keep businesses from going out of business? Yeah, so two, two things. A, um, I want to see what the legislature feels uh, comfortable with this concept of a public-private partnerships, feels comfortable with the quasis as we've described them, the advisory boards like I had. Obviously, there was some um, negative comment that got a lot of play, and I just want to get to the bottom of that. Do you feel confident with the structure if it's appropriately set up, or you just really want government to be public dollars and public sector employees? You know, more broadly, it's about reopening. Um, like I said, um, you know, Cuomo is reopening uh, next week. He's doing, he's opening things that we never even closed down here in the state of Connecticut, construction and elective surgery and manufacturing. Uh, so I'm doing everything I can with the scientific team, by the way, to give consumers and employees confidence it's safe to go back to work. Handle on some of the unemployment claims uh, and the con contact center, whatever. Uh, but the fact is, many people are going to need partial benefits for a long time because employers are not going to hire people back at full steam. What does that mean for Connecticut, for its budget, and how are you going to uh, handle that? I got about half of that. It's all noisy back there. But the. Um Look, in terms of a Department of Labor, we processed 580,000 claims, I think it is, which is probably two claims for everybody that's actually unemployed. A lot of people have gone back. A lot were on temporary furlough. But we put, I think, a five, six, eight point eight billion dollars, mainly federal money, out to work right now. But Sue, as you've heard me say a couple of times, let's not rely upon the unemployment. Certainly, let's not rely upon that six hundred dollar uh, true up they've got. That only lasts another six weeks. I've got to make sure that people know they've got to get back to work and know that they can do it safely. And do you want to give us an update on the negotiations with labor and their raises? The question is about um, labor and their raises. Um, yeah, I, we've had good discussions, um, but not productive discussions. I, um, I said, look, I. Um, I treasure the people that are on the front lines, especially those folks that are on the front lines uh, over this last, uh, you know, 90 days. Those folks who couldn't telecommute, those folks who were social service workers, those folks in corrections, those folks who are putting themselves at risk, those folks who, uh, you know, put themselves at risk of COVID. And um, if you were in the nursing homes, they got a raise. Others, I said, I think you deserve some combat pay. You know, that's how in my world, the private sector, uh, you delivered, and you delivered a considerable risk to yourself, and you deserve that. But I also said something else, Sue. I said, um, I can't see giving everybody, everybody in state government a raise right now, uh, scheduled for June 30th. I appreciate my predecessors, so I'll leave you with this uh, obligation. I would have put it off, and I think you should put it off. I think we're in an economy where you've got uh, close to 20% unemployment. I think you're in an economy where you see a lot of people on furlough. You see a lot of people taking, um, you know, 20% off their paychecks just so they can keep their jobs. And I think that would send the right signal, and that's how we work together. I'm not looking to lay anybody off, but I think that's what you should do. As much as you value public negotiation, can you withhold those raises? No, I tried. No. I, so I can't find any way that I could do that. So what's your leverage? My leverage is right here, right now, talking to people, saying, look, I think this is what we put on the table. I thought it made good sense. Combat pay for people that deserve it on the front lines. Others just take a pause uh, some months, just like I've seen in uh, many other states around the country. No, we don't have a lot of leverage under the contract for another year or so. But as much as you value public-private partnerships, nursing homes are sort of set up in the same way as private entities receiving some kind of public support and oversight. Um, is that really the correct structure for a nursing home with all of the problems that we've seen there? I'm not sure. That's a really good point. I mean, um, hospitals, you know, they're, they're sort of public-private themselves, but they stood up. They said, we're going to do everything we can for PPE for our people. It was easier to work. The nursing homes are sort of more independent actors. They're private, primarily private sector. 
and yet it was, uh, you know, I need more for frontline uh, nurses, which we gave more for frontline nurses. Uh, I worried about the uh, infection protocols there. We're doing a complete, we did three inspections of the nursing homes over the last uh, few months. Now we have an outside group doing as well to make sure that if something happens again in October, November, we're better prepared. There's a district judge that just came out with a decision um, basically requiring you to change a portion of your executive order with respect to the fingerprints for the new uh, gun applications. What, what was your, what's your response to that? A, I think we were about to do that anyway. B, every executive order I did was in the name of public health. And uh, at one point, you know, I thought the idea of people going in, fingerprinting was not where we wanted to be. I think we'll be able to work this through since uh, hopefully for now anyway our infection rate is very low and we're op reopening most of these things in the next eight days. Governor, when it comes to reopening bars, what numbers would you need to see in terms of testing or hospitalizations for that to happen? The question is about bars and nightclubs. Um, look, I worry. I mean, I saw what that super spreader in South Korea did and that, that represented hundreds of new infections there. And so, you know, in my hesitancy, bars, especially inside bars, nightclubs, not great for social distancing, mask is off. So um, I am hesitant, but obviously I will look at my neighboring states as well to see, all right, I think um, reality is set in, it's time to open up. So you don't have a specific level for the metrics that you want to see for that to happen? I don't have a specific metric per se, no. Are nail salons included in phase two? Yes. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jody. State campgrounds. <laughs> state, I was just going to ask about state campgrounds because some of the private campgrounds have been open since like the beginning of May. I think the state campgrounds, maybe these guys can help me, are July 8th. Not getting much help back here. I think July 8th was the theory because our camps, our, our, our um, parks are going to be pretty overwhelmed this weekend anyway. Camping will be more appropriate after the July 4th weekend. Governor, getting back to your public-private partnership idea, is that something you brought to labor that you maybe would do that with the agencies? Well, that's um, a little bigger. Um, in, in, do the agencies, what, Department of Social Services, you mean, or something like that? Well, you, you certainly see what's the most effective way to deliver social services, that's for sure. Governor, we get questions. People want to know... What's the rationale if hundreds of people can gather at Hammond Asset, granted, spread out, um, why the delay until July on when a socially distant graduation can take place? I think we thought, um, well, first of all, our graduations are up to 150 people on July 6th uh, outside. Um, we made that determination, what, a week or so ago. Uh, two weeks ago, we didn't know what uh, June was going to look like, so we're a little hesitant to be more uh, aggressive there. Uh, beaches, we never closed the beaches, as you know. We, um, we never closed the parks. We were very clear about 15 feet spacing, blankets and the such. And I think uh, you're right, though. What's the difference between a graduation and a wedding? That's another question you could ask. Well, we just thought a graduation is easier for people to social distance, easier for parents to uh, be there in the background and take it. And we'll get more aggressive uh, thereafter, depending on how it comes out. Right, anything else you'd like to say? Thanks, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thanks for the insight on your thinking about the reopen Connecticut plan. Um, I would just, for the Science Center's part, just um, say that we have appreciated the collaboration with the Reopen Connecticut team. Um, there have been very important and very specific aspects of the guidelines for indoor museums, of which we are one, um, that we've had a great discussion over, and our institution is able to implement the agreed-upon plans to assure that our visitors are going to be safe, that the experience will be enjoyable. Uh, and we look forward very much uh, to welcoming first our members on June 20th. Um, you can be sure that the rigors of a public-facing institution like the Connecticut Science Center, which is inherently about hands-on engagement with multi-generational customers, uh, presents its challenges. Um, and we've taken those on with great uh, seriousness. 
and um, it's involved everything from assuring that we have a proper supply of PPE and uh, stock of sanitizer to very specific actions. For example, we have very large spaces in the Science Center with a lot of sunlight, which are good things in terms of air quality and disease management. And we've added to that special filtering of our air conditioning systems, uh, changing the ratio of fresh air versus circulated air. A lot of these things sound kind of particular, like the 50-odd plumbing fixtures to move from you touch it to hands-free flushing. Uh, these are not glorious endeavors, but they're important to minimizing uh, the contact points uh, for individuals. And then we'll have a very rigorous cleaning program so that people will have the ability to self-clean um, exhibits, doorknobs, et cetera, uh, everything they touch uh, before and or after, but also that our staff will be doing those things. And we'll be moving to, and this is probably one of the biggest changes in habit that all public serving institutions like ours are having to confront to manage to the reduced capacity at a given point of time that the guidelines require uh, means that we have to know how many tickets we're selling at a port, part of the day. So we're moving to an online advanced ticketing model, which is happening in a lot of institutions. But that's a major change in behavior for our operations and also for our visitors. So we're looking for a partnership with our audience to take care of one another our staff, our visitors, and their fellow visitors. We're going to insist on proper utilization of face masks at all times, and we're going to provide every resource we can to assure that people know what to do and can have a visit that is enjoyable and safe. Um, so this is a small increment. I think most businesses, including ours, will come online at a loss. I mean, this is not like a fast recovery where you open the door and suddenly have enough revenue to pay the expenses that are actually in many cases increased to provide the service we have to. Um, but we are really, we're part of Connecticut, we're part of this community, and above all, we're a science learning institution that really is here for the purpose of inspiring people to think, act, and be informed in a science-minded way, not only in our actions today, but in the future through the generations that we serve. So that balance is the one we mean to walk, to make this a safe, healthy, enjoyable, educational experience uh, for all. So we appreciate the opportunity to talk about that today, to work with the team to do the reopening in the right way, Governor. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting back online in the very near future. Come on June 20th. Right? Thanks, Matt.